Good evening and welcome once again to Cornerstone Church Bible Study here on a Wednesday evening in Singapore. This evening we want to look at the subject of dealing with bereavement and how to deal with it in a biblical way because there's a right way to deal with it and there is a wrong way to deal with the subject of bereavement. We want to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 just to give us a passage to set what we want to say within the context and framework of Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 18, is a wonderful passage that gives us hope and comfort and guidance in facing bereavement. In verse 13, Paul says this to the Thessalonian Christians, But I would not have you to be ignorant or without knowledge, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are, aware, which, which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. And God will bless the reading of his own infallible word. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank thee that we have a framework to look at this one terrible subject that brings such terrible pain in the lives of men and women the subject of bereavement. And yet we find not just guidance, but hope and even deliverance from the sorrow through thy precious word. We pray that you would give us listening ears, that you would give us understanding minds and conform our will to your sovereign will in this matter. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now, life here on earth has many twists and turns and it is attended with many sorrows and losses for every human on this earth. Death is an enemy, the Bible says, that comes into our lives in terms of our relationship with others and even in our own life as we all must cross the border of eternity through death. And death is the ultimate consequence of the fall and of sin. It is a reminder to us that we live in a fallen world, that we live in a world that's decaying, that's dying, a world that's not eternal, a world that's heading for destruction. And oftentimes in life we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day living in the moment that we forget that in life we are in the midst of death. And the world that we live in is not to last forever. We're not to get too attached to it. We're not to get too attached to our own individual uh, lives here on this earth because one day we will have to say goodbye to it all. And death strikes at inopportune times to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors. And if you just open your newspaper, you'll read expressions of news reports like suddenly, unexpectedly, a tragedy occurred, a death occurred, and a man or a woman was taken out of this world. Someone once says the problem with death is that it's almost always unexpected. No matter how much you try to prepare for the passing, of a loved one, a friend, a neighbor. It almost always comes still as a shock because of its finality and the instant nature 
of it. Now, thankfully, the child of God has the word of God to guide him and her, or her in this area of life. And this evening, I just want to open God's word and hear what he has to say to us on how to cope with bereavement and loss and sorrow in our lives. And, and the first thought I want to leave with you is this, the reality of bereavement. The reality of bereavement. All of us come into this world at a moment and a time that God has appointed. And all of us will leave this world at a moment, at a time, and a place that God has appointed. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. So God says very clearly, I have put something in my divine calendar. And it's not put there by you, it's put there by me, he says. And it's an appointment that you have to keep, that you cannot avoid. And that every person all around us has to keep and cannot avoid. Someone said, when the grim reaper knocks on your door, you can't escape out the back door of the house. And that is true. The Bible tells us that life has a final point that God has appointed. But it also warns that life has a fragility that you and I can leave here at any moment and go out into eternity. In fact, in the Psalm 31, verse 15, the psalmist says, My times are in thy hand. In other words, our life, the, the hours, the weeks, the months, the years that we live here on earth that are given to us, are simply God's appointed time. We have no control over how long, how short a period that is. In Job 12, verse 10, we're told, In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Wow, what a statement. God holds your breath in his hand. At any moment, the one who gave you life can simply take that life away. Of course, that is a reminder to each of us that no death is really an accident. No death is a coincidence or bad luck. Every death of every individual is at the sovereign appointment of a sovereign God. And of course, that gives an element of comfort to us because every death of a loved one or a friend, therefore, is meaningful, has a purpose behind it. Even if it happens when the individual is young or middle-aged, whatever that time is, we can say with absolute assurance, it's under the appointment of God. There is a purpose. There is a meaning to it. But then this evening, I want to just focus mainly on this area of dealing with bereavement. And we've already read 1 Thessalonians 4, but I want you to keep your hand there in that passage, but also turn with me to Genesis chapter 23. Because in Genesis chapter 23, we have one of the longest narratives of a believer handling bereavement. And we have the story in Genesis chapter 23 of how Abraham handles the passing of of Sarah. Now we're told in verse 1 of that chapter that she died at 127 years of age. Abraham is 137. We don't know how long they had been married, but certainly she had been with Abraham all the years he was in Canaan and left Ur of the Chaldees with him, then up to Haran and all of the years then in Canaan. So at least over half a century they had been married, maybe many more years than that. Abraham is 137. Sarah is 127. She had been a very loyal companion and wife for Abraham. She had stuck with him through thick and thin. Even when he told her, God has called me to leave the great city of Ur with all of its culture and 
wealth and splendor and go out and become a pilgrim for the next 60, 70 years of my life. She never hesitated. She never argued. She rose up with him and became his loyal companion and helpmate. And although she wasn't perfect, she made some mistakes, like we all do. The Bible holds her up as a great example of what a godly Christian wife should be. In 1 Peter 3, verse 5 to 6, you read that example held up. And the Holy Spirit wants you and I to know that Sarah was a faithful woman of God. She was a helpmeet to Abraham. She was someone who, by her example, was able to teach others and to exemplify what God wants in a biblical woman. And Abraham would felt the pain of this great loss. It was a bitter blow to him. Having gone on all of these journeys with Sarah, having her as his constant companion, at times she gave him good counsel, at times she gave him not so good counsel. But by and large, the direction of her life was one of faithfulness to her calling as his helpmeet. And I want you to see how Abraham handles her passing because how he handles the passing of Sarah gives us lots of lessons in how to handle the bereavement of loved ones. The first thing to notice is this. We are to grieve the passing of loved ones without shame, without embarrassment. It says in verse 2 of Genesis 23, Sarah died in Kerjath Arba, the same as Hebron, or Hevron as the Hebrew puts it, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came, and it says this, to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. God made us as humans to have emotions. And it's not a sin to feel pain and sorrow, to weep over the passing of a beloved friend, relative, neighbor. It's not a shameful thing. In fact, it's a normal thing. It's a right thing to do. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon tells us there is a time to mourn. There is a time appointed to mourn. King David mourned over the passing of Saul and Jonathan. Later on, he mourned over the passing of his son, Absalom. He also mourned over the passing of Abner. He mourned over the passing of his son that was only, only lived a few days, his first son that he had with Bathsheba. So David mourned, wept over the passing of loved ones. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ did so at the tomb of Lazarus when he saw and experienced the sense of loss that the other family members and friends of Lazarus were having. He he wept with them. Joseph, one of the greatest men in Scripture, we read after the passing of old Jacob, mourned and wept for his father. And even the whole nation of of Israel took time to mourn for 30 days the passing of Moses. So it's not a wrong thing to do. It's not a shameful thing to do. In fact, it's the right thing to do. And one of the prices we pay for having real love in our relationships is that when those relationships are broken, we feel a sense of loss and sorrow. But then the second thing to notice is this. Not only should we grieve without shame, but the second thing is this. We should grieve with faith. When Abraham lost his wife Sarah, he grieved, absolutely. But he grieved with faith. If you notice, when Abraham comes to the sons of Heth to seek a burial place for Sarah, he doesn't refer to her as Sarah. In fact, he refers to her as, in verse 4, my dead out of my sight. In other words, the remains of Sarah, the physical corpse that is left behind when Sarah left this world, 
is not who Sarah really was. And Abraham didn't believe that. He believed that Sarah, the real Sarah, her eternal soul had gone on to glory. But what was left behind was just her physical remains. Not Sarah, not the real Sarah. And he uses a term, a very clear term, my dead. Just the the remains. To emphasize that. Of course, later on we discover in the book of Hebrews that Abraham was a man who believed by faith in the promises of God that there's coming a day when he would walk the streets of gold. He sought for a city, we're told, which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11 verse 10. So Abraham was a man who believed in the future, eternal, glorified state. And he looked for it by faith. So when Sarah died, all his hopes didn't die when Sarah passed away. He believed that there would be a reunion one day. And he believed that what was left behind, the corpse of Sarah, the remains of Sarah, were just that, remains, not the real Sarah. And that's why in the passage we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul emphasizes to the Thessalonian Christians, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He says they're just asleep. They haven't disappeared forever. And he uses a term to emphasize that when there's a person's asleep, there's an implication. They're going to wake up. And he says, those who have departed in Christ, they're just asleep. It's like saying good night to them. And you'll see them in the morning over there. It's not farewell. It's not an eternal goodbye. Paul says, no, they're just asleep in Christ. And he says, I would. He says, I, I, my hope, he says, in teaching this doctrine of the future resurrection, of the great reunion in glory, Paul says, is to comfort the people of God who've lost loved ones. And clearly in Thessalonica, many of the new believers there, relatively new Christians, had lost loved ones in the persecution. Some of them had been martyred. Some of them had died probably of natural causes. And Paul knows that they are concerned about the passing of their loved ones. And he says, it's my desire in writing to you, he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, is to instruct you, correct you, teach you that they're merely asleep. They haven't gone forever. And he says in this verse that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, he doesn't say you shouldn't sorrow. He just says... There's a right way to sorrow and there's a wrong way to sorrow. The wrong way to sorrow and grieve is like the unbelievers with a sense of complete hopelessness. A sense that you'll never meet them again. That it's over with. That the loss is eternal and permanent. And Paul says, yes, you should grieve. Yes, you should sorrow. Just like Abraham did over Sarah. But you shouldn't mourn without the eye of faith in your mourning. Your mourning should be rooted in in the word of God and in the teaching of God's word. And that teaches us in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In other words, Paul's saying this, because of the resurrection of Jesus, those who have died in faith in him, they will also see death defeated for them. Just as Christ rose from the dead, he's the first fruits, then the rest will follow. Just as Christ is the first resurrection, we will be in the next resurrection, in the future. And your loved ones who die in Christ, you will meet again. I often like to say to people who have lost loved ones, heaven is a place of perfect reunions. You will meet your departed loved ones in Christ over there in the glory land. You may not see them here again. That's true. And in a sense, that part of their lives is final and over. But it's not permanent, the farewell. It's just a temporary farewell. And they have simply gone before us to the better land. And because of the resurrection of Christ, you will meet them in the morning over there. 
It's no wonder having taught all of this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul ends the chapter with, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, if you talk to a, a person who has lost a spouse, a son, a daughter, a father, a mother, or a close friend, and they're Christians, and their departed loved one is a Christian, and you were to ask them, what's the thing you really, really would desire? And they would say, I, I just desire to be with them once again, to see them again, to talk to them again. And what Paul has taught here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is that will happen for the child of God. You will meet them again. And having explained how that happens and why that happens because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, the last enemy will be destroyed, death for us all. Paul says, wherefore, comfort one another. This is where you get comfort. You won't get comfort really from any other source than faith. In the word of God. That's why when I give the title to tonight's talk. I said it's grief and belief. Or belief and grief. The two things must go together. In order to deal properly with bereavement. But then a third thing we learn from Abraham's example. And from the rest of scripture is this. We must grieve with dignity. Abraham mourned. The passing of Sarah. He mourned by faith. The passing of Sarah. But he also was realistic. Scriptural. In his understanding of her departure. He recognized and fully recognized. That her passing must be marked. In a dignified way. And he personally. Although he was a very wealthy man. And we know from other parts of scripture. He had many many servants. He could have hired the best undertakers. He he could have entrusted all of these duties to someone else, including his son Isaac. It's very interesting in Genesis 23 how Abraham personally takes control of all these details. He knows that the passing of Sarah must be marked with dignity and must be handled well. And he personally must ensure that it is a testimony to all the heathen nations Around him. And you read Genesis 3. And it's very interesting. If you read all the verses of the chapter. How the vast majority of the chapter. Focuses on the procedures. Rather than the emotions. Now that's interesting. I think the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something. That when bereavement comes. Don't allow the emotions to overcome the duties. Of dealing with the passing of a loved one with dignity. And although Abraham's clinging by faith to the reunion. Of a future reunion with Sarah. He takes time carefully. In fact he spends money. Invests money to buy this burial place. And then handles the funeral arrangements himself. With dignity and honor and order. And it's letting you and I know this is how you do it. This is part of your testimony and part of the uh, honoring the departure of the loved one. That you don't allow your grief, your pain to overwhelm your dignity and honor. Particularly the dignity and honor of the person who has passed away. But then the fourth thing, and it's somewhat related to the third thing, is this. Grieve with balance grieve with balance I have met people who has been so overcome with grief not just in the immediate shock and subsequent days of the passing of a loved one but almost for years and years and years they never get over the loss to the point that they become almost paralyzed recluse they refuse to go out they they refuse to continue on in their duties As a parent, as a grandfather, as a son, as a daughter. They refuse to even participate in various ministries in the work of God. And they use their grief and the sense of loss as almost an excuse not to go on with the calling of God in their lives. And mourning can paralyze a person. And the Bible gives us the example of Abraham here. 
And Abraham suffered a great loss. Make no mistake about it. He came to mourn and weep over the passing of Sarah. She, she was someone very precious to him. She was the closest person on earth to him, humanly speaking. And he felt the pain of that loss, the bitterness of that loss. And Abraham was 137 years of age. And he's going to live for another 38 years. That may surprise some of you, but he lived to 175. And what you discover about Abraham from Genesis 23 right up until his death, he didn't give up God's calling. He didn't stop being a pilgrim. He didn't ignore his responsibilities. He was a father and then subsequently a grandfather. And Abraham kept on serving the Lord right to the end of the journey of life. And he accomplished many other things in the 38 years of his life. Did he feel the pain of the loss of Sarah every day? I'm sure he did. I'm sure every time he turned around to go into the tent to talk to her, she's gone. She's not there. And he must have felt it, particularly at meal times, particularly when he needed someone to communicate with, as this old man from the age of 137 all the way to 175. But then a fifth thing to grasp from the example of Abraham and of others in the Bible is that when you are going through a bereavement, grieve with others. Not just anybody, but God's people. Grieve with the people of God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, the Apostle Paul said this, Weep with them that weep. He says, one of the duties of a Christian is to gather around those who have suffered bereavement from the people of God in particular and uphold them, encourage them, be a blessing to them. Do what you can to help them in their time of loss. And you notice when Abraham lost Sarah, he, he didn't retreat into a cave. He, he wept publicly with those around him. Joseph did the same with his brothers over the passing of Jacob. When Moses died, we noted it earlier, the whole nation gathered around the family of Moses the friends of Moses, and they wept for 30 days. They mourned his passing for 30 days. And the people of God should be a place of comfort and encouragement to those who have suffered bereavement. And that may be just spending time with someone who is bereaved, maybe going for a meal, having a cup of coffee, maybe sending them a text message, maybe praying for them, maybe just sitting beside them like Job's friends did when they actually were a help to him at the beginning by just sitting quietly with him for seven days. And it's important, if you have suffered bereavement, to find the people of God, those who are walking with God. And you'll discover that those who are close to the heart of God, the closest to the heart of God, will have the warmest hearts at such times. And don't neglect the communion of the saints. Don't neglect the house of God, the place of prayer, if you've lost loved ones. And you will need them, those means of grace, more than ever at such times. But then fifthly, or sixthly, sorry, and finally, and this is really the most important point of all, really, and just because I put it at the end here of the notes, it doesn't mean it's the least important. In fact, if anything, it's the most important. Grieve with God. Not just grieve with God's people. Grieve with balance and grieve with dignity. And grieve with faith. And grieve without shame. But most important of all, grieve with God. God is willing and able and ready to help. He wants to be your help in your grief. And the loss of a loved one particularly one that's very close to you, carries with it not just a sense of loss, but often a sense of loneliness. And the Bible lets us know that death does not exhaust the promises of God. He is the one who says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. 
So in the sense of loneliness, because of the loss of that loved one, always remember God has not left you. God is still with you. He says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, come and bring your grief and losses to me. He says, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. The psalmist in Psalm 34, verse 17 to 19, gives us a wonderful insight into where he found comfort in times of bereavement and loss. He says, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth. Delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh or near unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. If you live life on earth, many times you'll suffer bereavement and loss. In fact, the, the longer you live here, the more troubles you will have. It's just uh, linked to the length of years. You'll, su- you'll go to more funerals. You'll attend more wakes. You'll bury more loved ones the longer you live. And the psalmist says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But here's the wonderful news. The Lord delivereth him out of them all. God the Father knows exactly what it means to lose a loved one. He gave up his son. He had to sacrifice his son. And he says to you and I, I will pour grace into the life of those who are broken in heart. Those who cry unto me, the righteous cry. And the Lord heareth. What a promise. And our Heavenly Father feels the pain that you feel. And he calls us into his loving arms. And he says, come to me. Cast all your cares, all your burdens upon me. And through our tears, we can rest on his unbreakable and unshakable promises to take care of us. Many years ago in the United States, there was a man called Frank Graff. Frank Graff was a minister, a pastor in the Methodist church. And Frank was a man who was known as the sunshine minister. He he always had a happy and a cheerful disposition. But Frank Graff went through many difficulties and bereavements. He lost his parents. He lost three of his sisters in a sudden death. He loved children, but he and his wife had no children. And Frank Graff was often comforted by that verse we read earlier. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Particularly that phrase, he careth for you. Because many times in life, we question, does Jesus care? Does God care about our bereavement? Does he even know? Is he even interested in our pain and our loss. And Frank Graff discovered the truth of First Peter 5 verse 7. Not theoretically. But experientially. In his own life. And he wrote this wonderful hymn. To bring comfort. And it has brought comfort. To the saints of God for many many years. Does Jesus care? And the stanza says. Does Jesus care? When my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song. As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. And then he answers it in the refrain. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. In a moment we're going to hear that wonderful old hymn sung. For us. But before we do so, I want you to seek the same Savior that Frank Graff spoke about in your tears, in your bereavements, in your pain. And you will discover, as he discovered, oh yes, he cares. He really cares about you. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee that in the darkest of days, 
in the bitterest of moments, we who are in Christ can find grace and help in our moments of need. We will discover that Jesus cares, really cares about us and our pain and our loss. We pray for anyone listening. You know the circumstances. You know the situations they may be going through. We pray that you would pour in the oil of joy from morning into their lives. May they discover that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, as the psalmist says. Bless us now. Comfort us through thy word and with thy word. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.